Hello. <laughs> it's so lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's always wonderful to be recognized and to get nice, shiny awards. And it never gets old. <laughs> but it's particularly meaningful to get one from, from an organization like the Women's Center that does such meaningful and such necessary work. So thank you. I feel very honored. I um, have been writing since I was old enough to spell. And writing is what I think of as my vocation. It is what I, I, I was born to do. I think of it as a gift that I was given. And I also think of it as a choice that I made to, to do something with that gift. But I grew up in a world where writing was not really considered aspirational. What was considered aspirational was to be a doctor, to be a lawyer. So I grew up in a, in a university campus, um, the University of Nigeria in Nsoka. My family was very close-knit. My childhood was happy. But I was expected to become a doctor because when you do well in school, you're expected to become a doctor. Um, and I am the fifth of six children. And all the other children of my parents were very sensible and did the right thing. And... <laughs> and my big sister, Rosemary, who is here with me today, became a doctor. She's sitting over there. <laughs> um, and it was useful that she became a doctor because, well, I don't want to, um, so I'm, I want to tell the story um, chronologically. So I did well in school and I was supposed to be a doctor, but I, I knew deep inside that what I really wanted to do was to tell stories. I wanted to write. Um, and I was a great, great reader. And so I would read books and I would write little chat books for my mother and I wrote poetry and I wrote plays and I just wanted to write. But I, I also realized I had to be sensible and think about me earning a living. And so I decided to go ahead and become a doctor. And my, and, and my, plan, my plan was to become a psychiatrist and then to use my patient's stories for my fiction. <laughs> so, so that was the plan. And, and, and I say this with great respect for all therapists in the world because they save lives, but I had planned to just use mine as a springboard for writing. But, <laughs> and so I went to medical school in Nigeria for one year. And I remember sitting in one of the biology classes in which we were dissecting frogs, and I suddenly thought, I don't want to do this because I was writing poetry at the back of my notebooks and I didn't care about the frogs that were being dissected. Actually, I was quite grossed out by them. And so I decided that I was going to leave. And, and at the time, really, leaving meant leaving Nigeria because I had been in what is called the science track, where they, when, you, when you do well, well in secondary school, they put you in a track where you, you're sort of in the class that takes chemistry and biology and physics. Because one of the sad things about the education system is that the arts are devalued. And so it's considered something that people who don't do well in school do the arts, which is such a terrible way of thinking about education, but anyway. And so I decided to leave, and, and leaving meant leaving Nigeria. And I was very fortunate that my sister Rosemary, who sensibly had become a physician, was now living in the US and working as a physician. And so I had somebody who would actually let me stay in her house and give me food. And so <laughs> I then took the exams. I was fortunate to get a scholarship to go to a college in the US, and so I came to the US. And so really, I came to the US because I was fleeing the study of medicine. <laughs> and, and I came to the US, and I was so happy to get the chance to, to take classes in literature and music and art history, and then to continue to write. And I'm also really grateful to my sister, Rosemary, because um, she kindly uh, supported me. And really, if she hadn't been here, I don't know if, I'd been, if I had been able to, um, if, I'd been able to if, I, if I would have been able to leave Nigeria and come here. And I remember when I made that choice, being told by relatives that it didn't make sense to leave the study of medicine, and to get into medicine was very difficult, very competitive, and I had gotten in, and nobody just leaves, and people particularly don't leave because they don't think it's right for them. People leave when they don't do well in the exams. But I also remember thinking, I want to try. I want to try. And if, if there is a moral to this story, 
it's that one of the things I've learned since then is that it's always worth it to try because you just never know. And fortunately, it turned out well. I graduated from college in the US. I had my first novel published um, shortly after I graduated. I actually wrote my first novel when I was an undergraduate, um, which was a terrible novel that nobody wanted to publish. But it was also a learning experience for me because having been rejected so many times by publishers and agents, I realized that that novel was false, that I, I had not written something that came truly from my heart. I had written the novel I thought that people wanted to read. At the time, this was maybe 2001, um, 2000, I had been doing a lot of reading of contemporary literature, and I noticed that many of the books that were sort of doing well were sort of the immigrant story, where the immigrant comes to the US and everything is wonderful, and the immigrant loves everything about America, because you know one thing about Americans is that they love to be loved. And, and, so, and so in these books, the immigrants were so grateful and they loved America and, and things were wonderful. And so I wrote that version. And instead of sort of the Chinese or the Indian, or I, I just inserted the Nigerian characters, but it was false. It wasn't true. And I'm so grateful that it was rejected many times. And so after so many rejections, I was, I was sad and bereft, but I put that aside and I started writing the novel that felt true to me. I started writing a novel that was set mostly in Nigeria, that was a coming of age story that was about religion and, and politics and, and love, and it felt true to me. And I had a difficult time getting it published because many publishers in the US at the time didn't quite know what to do with somebody who had come from a country in Africa, so somebody who was black but was not African-American and was writing about a country that people really didn't know about in Nigeria. I remember a publisher saying to me, I really like your writing, but nobody knows where Nigeria is. <laughs> and another very kind publisher, um, agent actually, said to me, I don't know how to sell you because you're not like any anybody else. Now, if you were Indian, I would say that you're the next Arundhati Roy, but you're not Indian. And so when I got that note, I started to think, how can I make myself Indian? <laughs> I, I was so eager to be published, and I was willing to do anything. <laughs> like, make me Indian. But, but finally, I was fortunate to get um, an agent who said to me, and I will never forget those words, she said to me, I am willing to take a chance on you. And from there, it went. She, and my, she sold my novel to a publisher in two weeks. Um, and shortly after the novel was published, I, I got the news that it was on the um, independent booksellers bestseller list, which I hadn't expected at all. I was so grateful to be published that that was enough. I remember thinking, five people are going to buy this novel. Four of them will be related to me. <laughs> And, and that's fine, I'm grateful. And so, and so there was a sense in which I was just so happy because my standards weren't very high to start off with. But, but so, so much has happened since then and I felt very fortunate um, and felt very grateful. So much has happened that has led to things like me standing here in front of all of you lovely people and speaking. But for me, what's instructive is that I, I did what felt true to me and and so one of the things I want to say, if there's anybody here who's thinking, I'm not sure, it doesn't hurt to try. And I often say to myself, what's the worst thing that can happen? Right? The, the thing about following what feels true to you, doing what feels true to you, is that it's not so much that it must always work out, because sometimes it doesn't work out. Right? Sometimes there are consequences that are not so great. But the thing is, you sleep well at night. And you know that you did what fell true to you. And I really think that that's very important. Since my first novel was published, I went on to, to write a second novel, which, which did really well. Um, and then a third novel, Americana. And then um, I also have given some talks. And I've been startled that people actually watch them. But I remember giving my second TED talk. And my friend who was organizing this TED talk in London said to me, we want you to come and speak. And I said to him, well, I want to support your TED talk, but I don't really have anything else to talk about. I've talked about the one thing I really care about in my first TED talk, which was called The Danger of a Single Story, which was about how important it is for us to, to broaden our perspective and not depend on stereotypes. So my friend said to me, well, there is the one thing that you're always lecturing us about. And I said, what? And he said, women's equality. 
And at the time, I hadn't realized that apparently, among my family and friends, I was known as a sometimes annoying lecturer on women's equality. <laughs> and so I said to him, really? He said, yes. You know, and I thought, oh, right, I guess I have been passionate about women's equality. I didn't know that I was lecturing my family and friends. And so I decided that, that you know, that it was worth talking about. Now, this TED Talk was focused on Africa. So it was in this huge auditorium in um, North London. And it was full of mostly Africans and friends of Africa. And I remember thinking that feminism is not a word that is particularly popular among those people. In fact, I don't think feminism was a word that was particularly popular among anyone, really, in the world. And I remember thinking they're going to be hostile. Um, it's not going to be a very warm and welcoming audience. But this is really the only other thing that I care enough about to talk about. And so I, I went in there, having already put up a kind of mental armor, but absolutely determined to talk about it. And I remember also thinking that what I hoped to do was to at least convince maybe two people out of the audience of, of, of a thousand, that it was worth it to talk about the equality of women, how important it was, and in a very simple and pragmatic way. I, I don't much care for theory. I guess theory has its uses, but I'm, I'm very interested in the ways that we can, in fact, start to change people's lives, women's lives, men's lives, where we start to live in a world of real equality, which is also a world I think will be of happier men and happier women. And one of the ways I think that that's important is that we have to start to raise children differently. We have to raise girls differently and boys differently. That we need to start to redefine masculinity. I mean, right now, this definition of masculinity is something where men always have to be strong. And it's so terrible, I think, that we need to start to let little boys cry, expect them to cry, expect them to be vulnerable. And we also have to let little girls know that it's OK for boys to cry. And so I gave this talk, um, and I was hoping nobody would throw stones at me, but they didn't, thankfully. And, but I was struck that at the end of it, they all rose up and clapped. And I, and I'm not even joking, I sort of looked behind me and I was like, wait, <laughs> who? But, I, but <laughs> and, and for me, again, it was another um, proof, I'm not sure if proof is the right word, but it was, it was um, for me, a, a sense of affirmation that it's always worth it to tell your truth. It's always worth it to do what feels true to you. It's always worth it to try because you never know. Now, I went in there expecting that they would boo, but I was willing to take that because I knew that even if they booed, I had spoken my truth, I had said what I deeply cared about, and I would go home and sleep well at night. <laughs> and, Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to end on that note, but I just want to say again how wonderful it is to be here, how wonderful it is to be honored, how deeply grateful I am, and how being in a room full of women just always makes me happy. <laughs> Thank you. And some men. Wow, I have been so looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> this is great. Please keep the, I mean, we, as, as part of this committee, we also get to invite the people we admire the most in the world. And so your name came up. Um, and all of us on the committee have a book club, and we've all read your books. And so it's just, it's amazing to have you here. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. Keep those questions coming, ladies I, and, and gentlemen. I do have some starter questions for you. And you know, listening to you speak about your upbringing, which wasn't full of violence, and then knowing about our mission, which is to help women and families who go through that, I wondered when you wrote The Purple Hibiscus, which is so full of fa a family ruled by the father's violence, mm. right, dominance, mm. how, not having experienced that personally, were you able mm. to write that? When I read that book, I just, I, it was like I was every night, like it held me in a cocoon. Yeah. It was so yeah. intense. How did yeah. you do that? Um, I think because I've always been interested in in domestic violence. My family, my father, and, and my poor father, when the novel came out in Nigeria, people were looking at him very suspiciously. So, <laughs> because in the novel, there's a father character who's terribly abusive. And so I would often start my uh, public events by saying, 
disclaimer, here's my father. He's the gentlest, kindest man in the world. I adore him. He's 86 years old, and he's just wonderful. But I, I, I've always been interested because I watched the world, and I saw, I, I saw what was happening around me. I, I knew of a woman who lived on the campus where I lived, whose husband beat her. And just in the most, um, for me, what was saddest was how she would then lie about it and defend him in public in that way that abuse is not just about the physical, it's also about what it does to women um, mentally. And, and so I was always interested in that, and I kind of wanted to explore that idea of, of, of how abuse doesn't end with the physical, how it affects the children, how it affects a woman's sense of herself, so that in the, in the novel, the character stays on. And, and, um, but it, it took, it took, you know, but also I, I do think that had I lived in a world of domestic violence, I'm not sure I could even write about it. I mean, I don't know, but I'm not sure because I think it's such a difficult thing. Yeah, yeah, it, it would be, right? It mm. would be almost too close yes. to the heart. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So that leads me to the next question. How do you pick your your stories, you know, what inspires you? Do you wake up one morning and you're like, I had this dream? <laughs> Sometimes. It often happens in the shower, actually. <laughs> Which has led to many showers being cut short. <laughs> Not sure what the implications of that are, but I, I you know, I'm, I, I think some writers are, are inspired by art and, and by other written works. Some writers are inspired by people and, and life. And I think I'm in the latter category. I'm very interested in people. I'm, I am endlessly curious. I ask often um, inappropriate questions of people <laughs> because I think that the role of the writer who writes realistic fiction that's set in the real world is constantly to acquire information. And I, I watch people. I notice the tiniest things about people. I invent lives for them. I sit in cafes and I eavesdrop in conversations of the people next to me. This is very important. And for anybody here who wants to write, I really recommend eavesdropping. Because you, you just, you, you pick up the most fantastic things, right? So, and, you, and I write it down, usually in a notebook or in my phone now. And then, and sometimes that becomes the kernel that starts a story. Really, it can come from anywhere. I love airports in particular because there's something that's so beautiful about watching people saying goodbye and watching people reuniting. I find that to be... It really just captures that wonderful human essence. Sometimes there's the droop in a man's shoulders after he's said goodbye to family members. Then there's just the incredible joy of people who are hugging. And I watch them and I imagine lives for them. Wow. I want to sit next to her at the airport soon. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make up this like wild love story. <laughs> So you've traveled all over the world. Do you have a favorite place, and if so, why? Huh. Um, hmm. Well, really, my favorite place is Nigeria, but that's kind of unbiased because it's home. But a place that isn't Nigeria, there's so many places. I, I love Nairobi in Kenya um, because there's, some, there's a gentleness to it, but also an energy. I really like Oslo in Norway. It might be because I have a dear friend who's Norwegian, but I just really like Oslo and I like wandering around in Oslo. Um, and I love Philadelphia because it was my... Anybody from I Philly? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Philadelphia was my first... Um, it was the first place in the US where I lived alone and I kind of grew up and became an adult, really. And I think it's a very beautiful city, so I love it. Mm. That's great. So I just got a question which kind of builds on this. And it, the, uh, the person asking says, you know, Nigeria is such a large country, such a big population, such diversity and poverty and, and wealth, and not well understood often, as you mentioned. Is there something you'd like to say about your country of origin, your, your background that you would like us to know about? Help us understand it. Um, read my books. <laughs> I read other Nigerian books, not just mine, but hey. Um, <laughs> Nigeria is very diverse. It's, it's difficult, but I suppose if I did want to say one thing, it would be that it's not just about Boko Haram. I think that when Nigeria gets covered in the news in the U.S., it's always about sort of girls were abducted, which is terrible, but there's so much more about, about that country. And, 
and that sometimes it can, in fact, feel like two different countries. I'm from southern Nigeria, and, and northern Nigeria can often feel quite um, almost exotic to me. And, and sometimes people don't understand that, so they, they expect me to explain all of Nigeria. And in many ways, I can't, which in some ways I think is this, the, the, you know, I'm not sure that somebody who's from Boston can necessarily explain Alabama. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair point, fair point, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> That's so very true, right? <laughs> Most of us will be happy to just explain ourselves to the world, actually. <laughs> so given your tremendous success, how has it changed you? Or has it changed you? Um, I like to think not. I mean, I, but, but on the other hand, it's, it's difficult to say because um, I think maybe some things have changed. So I'm, you know, t five years ago, I, I, I wouldn't have people sort of recognize me and say, can I take a picture? Which I still find very cool. Um, <laughs> but I think the things, the, the thing that, that makes me fundamentally who I am hasn't changed, which is that I'm, I'm still curious, endlessly curious about the world and about people. I'm still a reader. I'm still, I still sit at my desk and I'm, incredibly anxious that I will not be able to write a good sentence. And that has always been a part of my creative process, and that still happens every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need that tension, right? Before the next thing springs up. <laughs> that's what you, that's the thing one tells oneself to feel better about it, but when you're... <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's true. I mean, I think that there's a sense in which uncertainty is part of the creative process, but when you're there, sitting at that desk and the page is blank, you're terrified. You know, you're not thinking this is part of the creative process from which, <laughs> from which will spring a wonderful short story. <laughs> you're just panicking. That's what's Anything, a sentence, yes. a word, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, I love this question. Thank you. Um, it says, your inner joy is so inspiring. Please share your secret. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, well, so I think I'm fortunate to have, I have, I really do have the most wonderful supportive family in the world. And I think that had I not been raised by my parents, um, surrounded by their love and the love of my five siblings, I don't think I would be who I am. There is a, and, and particularly now with success and with, with becoming a public figure, which, which has its ups and downs, I feel very um, secure knowing that I have these people behind me. So in some ways, it's like having a cushion on my back, that I know that they're always there. And I have a small circle of very close friends who are just really the most wonderful people. And I think, I think that's it. I also have a two and a half year old daughter who is the light of my life. And mm -hmm. um, I should also say, because we're in the context of sort of um, the Women's Center, which helps women with mental illness, that I also suffer from depression. And, um, and I think this is true for many people who are creative. And it took a long time for me to come to a place where I, in fact, made peace with being a person who has depression and for whom depression will always be a part of my life, but, it, but it's about managing it. And, um, and, and, and I, I'm fortunate to have care and I manage it. And, but I, I also think that just having my two and a half year old, she's one of the better depression medicines that I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm sure that's not an easy topic. No, but I think, yes, but I'm very much interested in, in our destigmatizing um, mm -hmm. depression. It's, <laughs> Another question came up. So when you write, of course, you do write sentences in Nigerian. Your characters say things in an indigenous language, would you ever consider writing an entire book mm. in an indigenous African language? Um, in Igbo, which is mine. Um, mm. Okay. Um, I, so I think there are maybe four or five Igbo people here, so I'm now going to proceed <laughs> to say very unkind things about the entire room in Igbo. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I have thought about it. I'm actually thinking seriously about writing a children's book in Igbo. We, my husband and I are raising our daughter bilingual, so she, we speak only Igbo to her at home, and she's just started preschool, so she's you know, speaking English there. 
because we just think it's a gift to give a child um, to be bilingual. And so I've been thinking about writing a, a, a children's book in Igbo. I, because I was educated entirely in English in Nigeria, education is entirely in English, I, I don't really, I speak Igbo very well, but Igbo is the language of family and love and laughter. It's not really a language in which I can make a philosophical argument because I don't really, I'm not, I don't really know how to. Um, so I don't know that I could write a full adult novel in Igbo, but I'm really thinking about writing a children's book. Well, we'll look forward to that, and hopefully there'll be an English version. <laughs> or, which, or the other or. suggestion would be that you would all have to learn Igbo. Mm -hmm. There's a thought. <laughs> So I see a, more, a concurrent session next year where we're going to be oh. translating that book together when it's ready. That's a great idea. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be fun. So what are you reading now? Oh, I'm reading so much. I, um, I read many books at the same time. I'm reading a, um, a collection of essays by Elizabeth Hardwick, who I adore. I think she is just marvelous. I'm also reading A History of Nigeria. I'm always doing that because I'm doing some research. I'm reading poems by an African-American writer called Terence Hayes, who is sublime. Um, and I have just finished, um, oh Lord, I just, it's a, it's a book set in, uh, and it's so wonderful, I really want to recommend it. It's set in, in the Palestinian, it's sort of, it's, it follows a family, a Palestinian family, um, over about 80 years, you know, they, um, oh, I can't believe I don't remember. I just finished it yesterday. I don't remember what it's called. Can I remember and send you a text? Absolutely. So you can tell. It's such a wonderful book. And the reason I, I want to talk about it is that it's it, that, that the power of literature, how literature can, can humanize things. So after reading that novel, you, you, you cannot but look differently at the news when you see what's being covered, you start to realize there are actual people whose lives are actually being affected by what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is, it's funny how these questions just build right at the right time. What is the limit on how deep you will go in your writing about, your, is, is there sort of a stopping mm. point where it's mm. boundary? No, no. <laughs> I'll go no. anywhere. I, but I, I think that, and this is why I often say that I trust fiction more than I trust nonfiction, which is to say that as a writer, I feel that fiction gives me space to be as radically honest as I need to be. But nonfiction requires putting up boundaries because I want to protect people I love, or I want to protect myself. So when I'm writing about myself, even though the I is a character, you're very much aware of, of how you want the reader to, to respond to you. And so you shape it in a particular way, right? But when I'm writing fiction, I just, I'm in the world of the characters and I'm, there's a kind of radical honesty that fiction allows me to do. And I will write about anything. And actually, as a reader, I find that I don't like, I don't like books that feel too safe. I don't like books where you can tell that the writer is holding back um, because, because literature should be about a kind of truth where you go there, go there. <laughs> So I, I don't think I would um, hold myself back from writing about, I, I will follow whatever story calls me. Do you feel like sometimes you just, you're part of the story? Yes, sometimes yeah. I, I'm absorbed. When, when my writing is going well, it's the thing that it makes me so happy. I, it's almost like being transported. And then I, you don't realize how much time has passed. And, and that's actually the only times when I'm really fun to be around, when my writing is going well. <laughs> the rare times. Yeah. <laughs> so a question here that says, you are a beautiful style icon, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> um, any thoughts on representation for African girls, black girls, any, any thoughts, you know, as, as sort of taking on center <laughs> stage, <laughs> even more so? Um, thoughts for African girls, black girls, is that black girls are gorgeous. Um, and that, uh, and that if I if I really had if I if I if I had to be reborn, I would choose to have the skin color because black don't crack. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I mean I made the choice when I started out writing when I when I started out, when I was first published actually when I came to the U.S. I realized that, that that there's often a distinction made between a woman who's intellectual and a woman who's interested in her appearance in style in fashion. 
that if you wanted to be considered a serious intellectual, you couldn't then also admit publicly to liking fashion or liking makeup. And so for a, a few years, I pretended that I didn't like the things I liked. I grew up in a family, my mother is a beautiful woman who very much cares about appearance. She would dress us up properly all the time. Actually, sometimes I think she was disappointed in me because I don't think she felt I was you know, stylish enough. And, and so when I came to the US, I started to pretend I didn't wear high heels because I felt that that kind of meant I wasn't a serious intellectual. And I was so keen to be taken seriously. And a few years ago, I started to think about it and I thought there are young women coming after me who are also serious intellectuals who are interested in history and politics and ideas and also like fashion and makeup and hair and whatever. And I think it's important to start to create a world where, where, where women and girls are allowed to be many things, you know, that, and where we start to, those things that are considered traditionally feminine, that we stop making them something shameful. And so I made the choice to come out <laughs> as a fashion <laughs> lover. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I... <laughs> And, and you know, I find it interesting that even now when I, when I do interviews, I'm still constantly asked, you know, how do you explain your interest in fashion? And I'm like, I don't, I just like it. You know? <laughs> I, I like walking in high heels, thank you very much. But, but I hope that for women coming after me, that, that young women, that it, that it will be different. That, um, you know, that we, and, and fundamentally, it's that idea of not judging a woman by her appearance, right? That, that a woman, if she chooses to wear a sack, and no makeup, and let her gray show, good for her. If she chooses to wear high heels and the brightest red lipstick, God bless her. You know, we need mm -hmm. to have that range and have it mean nothing, you know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, I had a question here about how feminism has changed in your opinion, and I think you just hit mm -hmm. on a really important piece. Mm. It is not what feminism started out to be. You can be everything yes. you yes. are, yes. fashionable, interesting, yes. out there, and yep. still be a feminist, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And we need, we need to push more on that because mm -hmm. this idea that, you know, to be feminist means you don't shave and you... you and and I, think, I think actually... <laughs> and by the way, not shaving is fine, right? I really think if you don't want to shave, don't bloody shave. <laughs> You know, but, but, but I, really, the, for me, the, the thing that I find myself questioning is that the fundamental premise to all of that is that for, the way for a woman to, um, to, to be taken seriously is, is how well she approximates a kind of male, maleness, right? So if you, were, if you kind of look like the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who sort of, I mean, God bless her, that's her choice, but I think that that is the idea of what a feminist should be, that you don't care, you, you kind of wear a suit that looks like a man's suit and it, it can't be feminine in any way and you, you have to look. And I think that even that is an unfeminist idea because the whole idea of feminism is that we recognize that men and women are different, otherwise that, that in fact is the cause for the oppression of women because they're not men. But that we shouldn't then say that for women to be equal, that they have to approximate maleness. No, they remain women and you take them as equals. That's what it should be. Absolutely, right? Yes. Oh, we, we might have gotten a little help on that book title, The Way to the Spring or Once Upon a Country. Is that the book you... Wait, what book? The book you were talking about, the oh, 80 years of... Um, Once Upon a Spring, no, that's not it. No. The way to the spring? No. Nope. No. Okay, moving on. Um, the, um, I think it has house. <laughs> yes, yes, salt house, yes, yes, that's it, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh. yes. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> we feel better now. We, we have a Thank title. you. This is a. Yes. <laughs> well, final question. What is the most important advice you would give to someone who is an ins inspiring, aspiring writer? Right. Just do it. I, mean, <laughs> I, think, I think many people who want to write spend a lot of time thinking about wanting to write. And the thing about writing is just get to it, make the time. It, you know, 30 minutes a day, sit there. Sometimes the page will be blank, but sit there and try and make it happen. Write and read. It's impossible to be a good writer mm -hmm. if you're not a good reader. I just, I think it's impossible. Read widely, read to know what you don't like, because that's as important as knowing what you like. And then try very hard to sound like neither, 
what you like or what you don't like sound like you. Well, Chimamanda Miss Aditya, I hope I said that right, I practiced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have just reminded us that jumping into your passion is a really good thing. Just jump, even yes. if it's the water, you'll rise up yes. and you won't drown, yes. no way. Uh, and giving a voice to your truth, no matter what, to change stereotypes and to make an impact in the world. And thank you, keep, thank keep you. those books coming for all of us and <laughs> thank try. you for your time. Thank you, thank you all so much, thank you.